This video is about one of my most disturbing cases. It involves a serial killer, a circular saw, and a ghost. So let me begin. Years ago, as a young lawyer, when I was a prosecutor with the Attorney General's office, a fellow was charged with capital murder, death penalty. The origin of the case is that a woman went into a honky-tonk bar somewhere up in, in or around Phoenix City, Alabama. Two men approached her. They said, hey, you want to come out to our car and smoke some weed, smoke some marijuana? She said yes. She went out to the car. It was actually to, to the truck. Well, they kidnapped her. And they took her deep into some woods. And they tortured her. And they raped her. And then they murdered her. Well, the family, of course, was concerned that she was missing. They didn't know what happened to her. And they contacted the police. And the police, you know, they, they did some investigating. No leads. And... Frankly, at first, they weren't that worried because they talked to people in the bars and people kept saying, oh, yeah, I saw her. And the stories were all about the same. Something along the lines of, gee, she was just in here the other night and I saw her, she was at the kind of the periphery, the edge of the crowd. Maybe she was hanging around by the jukebox or over at the other side near the pool table. I just saw her for a couple of seconds. I looked away, she was gone, she had melted into the crowd, I don't know where she went, but yeah, I saw her here last night. So, since people kept seeing her, the police thought, oh, you know, she's just, you know, drifted off here and there, and maybe she's, you know, staying over somebody's house or something like that. They weren't worried. The problem was, she was dead. One of the two men who was involved in killing her, who I'm going to call the drifter, he did what drifters do, and he wound up in a bar in Florida. He's drinking. He's drinking next to another man. And the drifter starts bragging his drunken state. And he tells this fellow, hey, me and another fellow, we murdered and raped this woman up in Phoenix City, Alabama. Well, the guy on the next bar stool, he goes and he calls the police. The police come and this guy repeats the story to the police. He, I guess he had to confess it. Those police in Florida contact Alabama police. They take him up there and he leads them the body in the woods or to the grave. They dig it up and there she's, there's her body. Well, the day that we went to court to begin the death penalty case, or that we were about to go to court, showed up in that, the Attorney General's office and the more senior lawyer said, hey, we're not going to trial. Huh? Well, what do you mean? He says, we're going in the woods. We're going to dig up another body. What, what are you talking about? We struck a deal with him. And the deal was this. We suspected that he had killed this other woman, and we told him that we would spare his life and not give him the death penalty. We'd give him a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole for this murder and the other murder if he'll just tell us where the body was. Well, he had already taken the police out in the woods after that deal was cut and shown them the location. We were going up there to confirm whether or not there was a body where he showed us. We had told the police that he had buried her and thrown a piece of roofing tin. Now this is a different woman. Thrown a piece of roofing tin over the body. We go up there. I remember we're, I'm, I'm in a car with an investigator. I remember we're going through this logging road. The car's getting all beat up. And I remember turning and saying, is this your car? He's like, ah, oh, it's a state car. I, I never drive my car through this. So we get deep into the woods. And there's police crawling all over the place everywhere. And they had already started digging the what they thought was the grave spot, and they've got down to the place where the roofing tin was. They hadn't peeled it back yet. I got there, and a short while later, some other police officer arrives, and he's carrying a big bag of crystal hamburgers. It's hot, sweaty, and he passed out these hamburgers, and we're exhuming a grave, and everybody's eating these hamburgers. And I remember him eating a hamburger. wasn't really hungry, but I kind of wanted to fit in. And I'm eating this hamburger, and I'm thinking, please, don't throw up, don't throw up. And then they peel back the roofing tin. I didn't throw up. I, I did not throw up. But at first when I looked, I, I couldn't tell what, what was I looking at. It wasn't clear. It just looked like dirt and roots and things. Well, as they got in there and brushed and cleaned and, and dug a little more, gradually you could see there was a human rib cage. You could see other bones. But as I looked, I, I thought to myself, I can't figure out what's the position of this body. It, things didn't make sense. It was all jumbled. We found out the reason later on. When the forensics came back, they told us that the body, the girl, had been cut up with a circular saw. And this woman 
had been tortured just like the other woman in ways that are so horrible I'm not going to go into it in this video. But if you remember, the deal that was struck with this fellow, with the serial killer, was, hey, we'll let you get life without parole for two murders, provided you gave us this, the location of the second body, which he did. But he had never said anything about, or the state had never said anything about, what happens if we find a third body? And as a young prosecutor, my thought was, hey, you know what? There's a bunch of women missing around Phoenix City and in, a, and in that area of Alabama. If we can find one more body, he can be prosecuted all over with no deals, no bets, nothing. In evidence was a map that this fellow had drawn. He hadn't told us what it was, but there was strange cryptic markings on the map. I called an FBI profiler and I spent some time on the phone talking to him. What he said is, based on what I told him about the cases, he said, well, this guy's escalated. What's escalated? Serial killers, to get their sick jollies, have to do increasingly horrible things because just killing somebody doesn't give them enough of a thrill. And as time goes on, they escalate what they do and they do more and more horrible things. And because this man had done, the, the serial killer, the main guy, had done such horrible things to this woman, the profiler said, your guy is very escalated. He is an experienced killer. He has killed many times before. And those women who are missing, they're probably they probably were killed by him. Oh, and that map that you guys have, serial killers like him, this profile, it's not unusual for them to revisit the certain, th these areas that they frequent, the scenes of their, their crimes and their locations. And since you found two bodies within a relatively short distance of one another, there may be other bodies out there. So I called a, uh, a archeologist at a, one of the colleges in Alabama and organized a search party. We we're going out to look for other bodies. We knew that there was other women missing if we could only find a body. Remember we went out there and back to the location and there was a bunch of college students who were helping and at the scene there was a tree limb and one of the things that this savage had done is he had hung up one of these women like a deer to be gutted and I think that's exactly what he did. And the ropes from where he tied her were still hanging down the tatters of the ropes from the, from the tree. Some college girl, she jumped up and held on. And, and I remember it sent a chill up my spine. At any rate, we searched and searched the hot day. And we found under the roots of a tree, we found a, a long, rusty butcher knife. We found a woman's shoe. We found some Mardi Gras beads. But we never found another body. So. If you're hoping that the story would end with, oh, he got the death penalty or something like that, it doesn't. He's still alive. He's in prison in Alabama where, unless he escapes, he should spend the rest of his life. What I do as a living is now I'm a criminal defense lawyer and I help people who are in a jam. Fortunately, I don't have people like that who usually call me. But if you are in some sort of legal trouble and you want our help here at Siegel and Siegel, just give us a call. We're happy to help you. We'll tell you what we think of your case for free. Our phone number's below. I hope you found this video to be educational. I hate to use the word uh, entertaining, but interesting. And thank you for watching.